Albert? Here. Cooper? Here. Ferguson? Here. Latin? Here. Pauli? Here. Ginelli? Here. Matrina? Petrofessa? Here. Tabersack? Here. Transilla? Here. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to start with our recognitions. The first one is Kate. Um, this year, Kate, the Kate Student Leadership Award program has expanded to include middle school students and high school students who exhibit exemplary leadership skills. One male and one female from each school in, in the district is eligible to receive the Cape Studentship. Student, student, I can't, can't speak of it, I just doesn't know the story, right? So bear with me. Cape member of the district, was, um, they were eligible to receive the Cape Student Leadership Award. These awards are given based on the criteria, leadership criteria of willingness to take Arms challenges, capability to make difficult decisions, concern for others, and an ability to work with others, a willingness to commit um, to a project, diplomacy, an ability to understand issues, and an ability to honor a commitment. We are proud to announce this year's winners. When I call your name, if you just can come, come up, and superintendent will give you an award. In January High School, we have Danielle Biel, Biel and Nicholas Getz. Okay. All right. 
Talk amongst yourself. Okay. Yeah. Here she is. The rest of you guys are done. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. convention here in Danbury at Westcon approximately six weeks ago and we had 35 finalists and so I'm going to read their name their school and their project and then I'm going to talk about from these 35 the 10 students who um, the 35 went up to Yukon for the statewide competition and the 10 students who were recognized as inventors at the statewide competition so I'll bring them up separately um, I'll repeat their names at the end and they'll be each getting a certificate. So from Broadview Middle School, Anna Spaulding had the zip clip from Rogers Park Middle School, sixth grade STEM. Uh, Divya Bishop had mail rider. Aiden Castricone had butter pump. Jaden Cazorla invented amazing awakening. CJ Cianflone, the cool helmet. Braden Callahan, flag a server. Clarissa Lugo Commons, mobile change. Alex Mays, automatic dog washer. Jesse Patton, push and brush. Jack Pompilio, Easy Carrier 3000, Joe Stefanelli, Medi Sip and Smile, Nicholas Taylor, Ladder Caddy, from 7th grade STEM in Rogers Park, Rebecca Benedetti, Don't Forget, Ashley Corey, Tea Toy, Sophia Folino, The Guardian, Nathaniel Hornick, The Yard Net, Christopher Wang, The Gym Bag Air Circulator, well, we all need those, <laughs> Madison Ayamazo, Lash Lens, Jacob Liam, Keep Him In Tune, Lauren Pudelka, all in one trip, Justin Salamini, baseball dryer, and from the Magnet School, uh, the Academy for International Studies, Maggie Bro with Vexed Book, from Great Plain Elementary School, Lorenzo DeLuca with Cane Helper, from Hayestown Avenue, Sarah Beckley with The Use It All, Kanchen Surish with Pencil Problem Solver, from Pembroke Elementary, Grace Carey with Snow Bo Snowy Boot Cozy, Liam Clark had Police Direction Gloves, Sakura Claudio had the spray comb. Jennifer Grant had dog dryer. Eddie Jimenez had stuffed backpack. Gianna Taft had face protector. At South Street, Soraya Poem had magnet eye bookmark. From Shelter Rock Elementary School, Audrey Hinn had thin heat. And Natalia Ruiz Laura had stuffles. And from Stadley Rock Elementary School, Anne Marie Hickey had that's cold. Now these are the 35 finalists from Danbury. Uh, we had over 350 students competing at our local, and we sent these 35 students up to UConn um, a week ago, Saturday, May 3rd, and here are the 10 that are coming up to receive a certificate from Dr. Pasparella. Um, from Rogers Park Middle School, Braden Callahan, um, Clarissa Lugo Commons, Jack Pompilio, Ashley Corey, Sophia Felino, and Nathaniel Hornick. Okay, um, from Pembroke, Grace Carey and Liam Clark. From Shelter Rock, Audrey Hinn. And from Stadley Ruff, Anne Marie Hickey. Did you get the one? 
just get right under there. Just move down a little bit. Just keep moving. 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 If any of our other finalists are here, please have them come up for the picture, please. The board welcomes public participation. Ask the speakers please limit their comments to three minutes. Speakers may offer objective comments on school operations and programs that concern them. The board will not permit any expressions of personal complaints or defamatory comments about Board of Education personnel and our students or against any person connected with the Denver Public School System. No one has signed up ahead of time. Is there anyone in the first row that would like to speak? I'm seeing none. Anyone in the second row? That would like to speak. The third row, fourth row, fifth row, anybody in the room that would like to speak that's not sitting up here at the table. <laughs> no, not in the cell either. No. Okay. Thank you very much. The consent calendar. Kathy, do you have a motion? That the Board of Education approve the oh. items on the consent calendar as recommended and exhibits 14-96 through 14-102. Second. Second. Seconded. Any discussion? Any comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Objections? Nothing. Okay. Going on, uh, we have a, is there an employee representative in the building? Or do you want to speak? Our student representatives are here. Yep. Would you like to start? Sure. Hi, I'm Danielle Beal. Hold on. Okay. Hi, I'm Danielle Beal, the Board of Governors Secretary at Danbury High School. Um, we are holding our senior, our upcoming senior class elections tomorrow during advisory, and we recently held our Gatsby themed junior prom, and I heard it was a great success. Um, senior prom will be held May 23rd at the Matrix Center from 7 p.m. to 12 p.m. Um, and then our, six flag, our senior class Six Flags trip will, be, will follow in June. Um, May 31st, we are also having our annual quota festival, which will be held in the courtyard of Danbury High School. Um, the incoming NHS induction ceremony will take place this Monday in the DHS Auditorium. And senior graduation will be held at DHS on June 17th. And that's all. Thanks, Dana. Mm -hmm. Are these ready with Mace? <coughs> Come on. Natasha, ready? I got the rule. Seniors attended a field, field day today to Bradley Lowell 
to explore the vocational trades that are available at this school right here in Danbury. On June 4, 5th, and 6th, A students will embark upon their last outdoor education trip of the year with a white water rafting excursion in the Lake George area. Students who wish to attend who are failing classes are required to stay after school four times prior to the trip to improve academic grades in order to make them eligible. Thanks so much, Natasha. Okay, moving along presentation for Denver High School, I, the um, student uh, school governance councils. Yes, get Mr. Kashiwas here. As the board may know, we have the, uh, the <laughs> school councils that have been in operation, I think, three years now. And each year we've asked them to come in the spring and do a brief an update. I welcome the high school uh, for thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kachua. Thank you, Good evening, and thank you for giving us this opportunity to report to you. Um, I, with me this evening, I have Devang Patel, who is our president of the School Governance Council and a parent member. And also here to support us is parent members Mary Angela Amendola, Mary Angela, Albert Schneider, Eileen Klein, and Richard Matzinger. And before Devang gives his presentation, I will tell you that uh, we had a tremendous challenge to try and pare this down to 10 minutes because literally this group has worked endlessly and tirelessly on behalf of Danbury High School. It's really been a wonderful collaboration. Um, they've done a tremendous amount of work, not just at the monthly meeting, but more importantly in subcommittee meetings that occur pretty regularly throughout the school year. So what you'll see tonight is just a smattering of the work that they have done uh, but I will tell you, it's, it's been a terrific collaboration, and I very, very much appreciate all of their hard work and their efforts. Dr. Uh, Vang? Thank you very much, Gary. Well, I was before you here last year about this time, and was very, very excited to talk to you about all the great things that our group does with a great deal of passion, and that passion continues even today. Um, obviously, this year we started with uh, several new members, um, and, and that took a little bit of transition time for us to get up and going, but uh, I think we were very quick to respond and certainly kept on working on the things that were important to us. I want to take you through very quickly, in summary fashion, um, what's in front of you now, but um, a couple of things that I just want to kind of highlight as the transition from when we started three years ago to the second year where we actually started making recommendations and actually acting on a certain certain set of things um, and working collaboratively with Gary and the school and the board and so on, I think we accomplished a great deal. Um, I think we initiated uh, uh, several things that have come to fruition in, 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 in great fashion, have delivered some really great results, and we hope to continue to, to see some of that go on. So you might see some of this as repetitive from previous years, um, but then some added uh, value to this as our new group members kind of weigh in here. Um, so as you know from previous years, um, our, our goals are, uh, are slightly changed. We had a much more grander set of goals when we first started out because, of course, we threw everything at the wall that we wanted to attack. Um, and uh, we kind of tried to scale it down to, to meaningful and practical things that, that, that we can do. Um, so moving on to a couple of slides forward here. This is year three. We're going to need two more new parent members this year. Uh, as graduating seniors, we'll uh, turn them into potential community members uh, as part of the group, hopefully. Um, and we'll need another community member moving forward here. Um, the goals have, I think, been boiled down to working a lot more closer with Gary and uh, in making meaningful changes or making recommendations that can translate to something practically happening uh, within the school uh, where we can see results rather quickly. Um, we have done a few things, I think I'll talk a little bit about them, but I, I like to use the word collaborative a lot more today because I think we've come a long way <laughs> uh, for, uh, in the last couple of years. Um, I, one of the, uh, I guess, the uh, observations that I personally had and I think many people have, is that we, in the past, we've been reactive, hey, there's an issue, how, you know, we talk about attendance or curriculum or whatever, 
And we react to that by saying, hey, give me data, let me understand what's going on, and then the group will have discussions and, and do some analysis and perhaps uh, you know, make a set of recommendations that may help to, to improve performance. I think the group, as we sustain ourselves, the Governance Council is here to stay. It's going to be with us for a long time. I won't be with you for a long time. Um, but the, the question of sustainability and how this group performs over time continues to weigh on the group and how do we continue you know, the forward progress of, of things. So a, a part of that is, is a focus on defining metrics, tracking results. You know, when, when recommendations are made, when we make things happen, how are we going to make sure that we understand what the results are you know, moving forward? And is it a one-time thing that we do or do we want to sustain and maintain and keep them on going forward? So some of the thoughts that we've had um, uh, along those lines. Uh, moving on to curriculum, there's always the subject of a lot of discussion in our, <laughs> in our meetings associated with curriculum and the changes in the curriculum. And I know that it, you know, in, from the core curriculum perspective that we started those changes and we're in a sense still in a transitionary period as, as we kind of grow into what that will ultimately translate to into student performance and so on. But the, the, the issues are relatively the same, where we talk about, yeah, transition, there are issues with that. There are, you know, the current students that were used to doing st things differently now, uh, doing things in a different way. Uh, you know, varying learning ability of students and so on, overall student performance versus the core curriculum. So I think a lot of recommendations that the group had is to, is to provide supports for those, uh, for those students who might you know, require those supports based on their learning abilities and so on. So uh, I won't read through all of this, but I think the recommendations that, you know, we continue to talk about is when we, you know, for all change initiatives or anything that we've talked about, you know, as an example, Dean of Student Supports and so on, we need to talk more about how do we maintain those supports over the course of time. And sometimes that's challenging, right? We try to put something in place whatever the reason, budgetary or otherwise, uh, I think the thought process that if something is working, why can't it keep working <laughs> moving forward? Or can we add to that and, and have it perform better? So those kinds of things, I think we've done a good job in communicating uh, with parents. Uh, this year, probably, we haven't done any newsletters uh, this year, but in the past we had, um, but I think collaborations with the library that you might have heard about where we uh, attempted to talk to parents about you know the policies and procedures at the high school that recently occurred with Gary and, and a group of teachers and, and folks at the Danbury Library and, and that was pretty well received. It's just reaching out and trying to engage parents and, and helping them to understand the cause and effect of policies and what they mean independent specifically. Um, calendar changes, we talked a lot about that last year where you know how do we organize PD and how do we change things that can add more instructional time for students. I think that's added some value in, in, in how we think about the calendar moving forward. Um, summer programs, which we heard about, which was, um, you know, we constantly hear about the good that that's doing, um, you know, even at the, the middle schools before they enter the high school sort of thing. All good things uh, that, that we're very excited about and we'd like to see continue. Um, focus on just deans of student support, you know, the grade through, on grades 10 through 12 now. Uh, but the initial success that we've had, um, you know, would suggest that, that was, this could be effective for, for other levels. Um, just increasing the tutoring support, I know that's been of issue uh, in, in recent times. But these are things that were suggested that kind of helps to increase student performance in those specific areas that, that is absolutely necessary. Um, so just continuing to support the ideas that are working <laughs> in the school. And, and our perspective is we see the reports from, the, you know, from Gary and, 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 and faculty and others who see these things working. But I think one of the, the important aspects as we look forward and so on is to create a set of dashboards and say a set of data metrics that allow us to see how we're doing over time where the council can, you know, be reviewing this kind of information and making suggestions as we move forward. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's an important thing to do. I mean, even in our business environment, this is how we live and breathe, is data, metrics, and how, how do we change things moving forward to perform. Um, 
So analyzing data and that concentrating of data is very, very important. I'm going to move on to the next thing because we can talk about Flickr all day long. Um, huh? <laughs> um, attendance, uh, you, you know, I think that uh, you're likely aware that attendance has improved at DHS. Um, and the whole, you know, the uh, ninth grade entry situation for students that causes some issues and so on. Uh, I think with the deans of student support in those areas that haven't been applied has had a significant impact in regard to that. Um, so, chronic absenteeism has decreased, but it's still an issue, and it always will be, right? And we're never going to be perfect, but I think it's important to focus on this area because when the kids are not in school, they're just not going to learn, period. So how do we help to improve that? So we're looking for ways to maybe reach out more, maybe talk with parents more, have them understand the consequences of not attending school. It's more than not just attending, they're just not getting, they're not going to be able to make up what they miss. So implementing uniform policies throughout the district might be a useful thing, so when they get to the high school, they understand what it is. Um, so the other issue that I think is also important, because when we look at attendance data, sometimes we ask the question is how accurate is this data? You know, and, and sometimes reporting attendance on a day-to-day -day basis is challenging for a lot of folks, but we find out that, uh, you know, the numbers are perhaps not as accurate as they could be because the reporting or the entry of data is, is not done as accurately as we need to be. Uh, I'm gonna, I, I'm, you're gonna, you can read through the rest of this, but I think if you get the general gist, that the focus on ad absenteeism is one of the core things that the Governance Council focuses on. In addition to curriculum, parent engagement on the second page, on the next page. Um, you know, I think power school has had a significant impact on parent engagement. I think folks know what's going on. I think they've, uh, you know, begun to, you know, have gone through that grace period of learning. I think having it available now in the middle schools makes a big difference when they come to the high schools. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are things that are working and we should continue to support and help them understand how to access this information. Um, I think one of the big areas of focus this year with, with help from um, Mr. Schneider, which you've spent a lot of time with uh, throughout the year, um, you know, a collaboration with WestCon and, and helping the school uh, do some things over the summer with some resources, that's, that's been a useful thing and hopefully that we can continue that and go over the course of time. But we find ourselves always on the technology front being challenged because it, it's tough to catch up to the state of the art. It costs a lot of money and it takes a lot of resources to, <laughs> to manage all of that. Um, but in understanding all of those things, I think the council can, you know, constantly is thinking about and, and wondering you know, about you know, what, are our, what are our opportunities to take some leaps and advances in, in those areas <coughs> that can really significantly go towards helping student performance, you know, improving student performance in many ways. Um, so things like grants that perhaps we're not, we don't have access to today that we could be looking for. And I know that we're focused on some of these areas right now, but um, you know, other forms of fundraising, reaching out to the community and business in different ways, um, reaching out to alumni at Danbury High School too. So there, there's a bunch of things that we're thinking about uh, that can potentially help uh, in this area, but I think we're all uh, with a solid understanding that we need to make some way, you know, moves on the technology front. Um, so moving forward, I think budget. One of the one of the discussion points of the school uh, of the council this year had been uh, about the budget, and uh, I know the council uh, would like to learn more about the process and perhaps be involved more, just so that we can add potential value and collaborate and understand uh, more to make. Uh, potentially help with uh, uh, suggestions and, and work with a variety of folks that can help to uh, uh, develop uh, or manage the budget and help you manage the budget. But in, in addition to that, um, you know, the, the, we always find ourselves in a, in a situation where we don't have enough budget to support all the things that we want that we want to do. And that's the case everywhere, right? It's no, no surprise. But I think that we find out by you know going out there and talking to other school districts and understanding from other folks fundraising mechanisms that they have in place, and we should maybe look to model that for for ourselves. Um, so one of the significant components, and I think that folks have kind of heard about this, is the Governance Council 
uh, is, is in the process of developing a set of bylaws for a Danbury High School foundation of the sorts that will be a nonprofit organization, of course. That intent is to raise, you know, funds and, and go out, do fundraising activities to support the efforts of the school, but particularly on those items that improve student performance, because that's the focus and the goal of the governance council. Um, so it, that's in its formative stages. We did draft bylaws modeling others uh, that, have, that are already out there. Um, we're going to be seeking um, some help to make sure legally that we can we have all the right things in place, um, and then you know provide a mechanism, you know a structure to it, and then hopefully uh, by the by the end of this year and through the summer, and perhaps by the start of the, the next year, that we have this organization up and running. Um, I, we're very, very excited about that. I think it represents opportunities for to go after, you know, grants funding that normally the district doesn't go after today. And I think there's plenty of opportunity uh, to, to realize some benefits out of that. Um, and also reach out to areas that currently the district can't reach out to for whatever reason, you know. So I think we're very excited about this. I think we want to, you know, for, reach out to the business community, even to the diverse community that we have in Danbury, um, to the alumni. There's a whole slew of ideas floating around of how we can be, uh, you know, maximizing the value of uh, this type of organization. So going forward, and I think I'm probably at 10 minutes by now, but, um, you know, we concern ourselves moving forward. Um, we want to target our resources and our own capability to maximize our results. We're not going to focus on, you know, 50 different ideas, but focus on the top three kind of thing to get things done. Um, you know, I think analysis, uh, we want to continue our analytical kind of stance that we have. We always ask for data. We always ask for, hey, how, how do we back up a decision or a recommendation that we're, that we're looking to make? Uh, you know, implement and potentially enforce attendance policy district-wide. I think we need to, you know, I think there's still a strong sense associated with attendance. When the kids are there, they're learning. When the kids are not there, they're not learning. So how do we get the kids there? We want to continue to look for opportunities to communicate more and not necessarily enforce, but then maybe support, you know, uh, uh, the kids getting to school. Uh, so uh, the whole school-family partnerships, just active parent engagement, the parent contact that we had last year, we're going to play on those things and continue to, uh, you know, focus on how do we get more and more of that going. Um, getting involved and at the Board of Ed and at the city level and the budget, just understand and, and, and whether or not we should be, as parents and as citizens of Canberra, worried about certain things that are happening and, put, and we should be in a position to support, you know, various policies, uh, even at the city level. So uh, we want to launch this foundation, and that's one of the goals that we have. Uh, for this year, and then refocus on ideas that are working. You know, uh, we want to focus on those and continue them and figure out how we sustain all of these things. So that's all I have for you today. I think uh, if there's any questions, I'm happy to. As I indicated, you know, going back to the start, this has been a group that has worked tirelessly and endlessly on behalf of DHS. I'm really excited about this new Hatters Foundation. I see that as being a vehicle where we can raise a tremendous amount of money to support the learning that's going on at DHS. We've gotten a great deal of advice from Westcon. Daryl Dennis happens to be on our, our governance council, and he's uh, quite involved with the foundation of Western Connecticut, which has raised millions of dollars over a number of years. So we're excited about that. Uh, Albert Schneider and his Committee on Technology has done a wonderful job with connecting us with Western Connecticut. Last year they provided two student uh, computer science majors that came into the building and worked with Yevgeny and his team uh, to refresh a lot of software, to repair some things, to set up things. And this year we've gotten a commitment from Western that they're going to give us four student interns to work at Danbury High School to help with the refresh and preparation for next year's SBAC testing and all of the computers. So that's really an exciting initiative um, that's going on. Uh, the attendance committee, nobody in the world has found the answer to how to you know, get all kids to school, but if anybody will, it'll be this group because they're looking at data, they're talking to other schools, they're working very hard on that as well. Uh, for the first time this year, we had a terrific um, presentation at the Danbury Library. We provided the library with our student handbook, with our course of study guide in English, Spanish, and Portuguese because we have a lot of folks that come into the library from downtown Danbury 
uh, that now they, they're prepared. We also train the library staff on our parent portal so that they can help uh, particularly ESL students and their families access the portal and know how to use it. Uh, so that's been a wonderful collaborative. We've also established in the past a collaborative with the Hispanic Center and uh, New Hope Baptist Church. So those are all exciting things that are going on in the parent engagement committee. And again, our curriculum committee continues to work at ways to improve student achievement. So of the, the, the 14 or 15 people that are on this committee, there's five active groups that are working all the time and, and working very, very hard. And, and I'm extremely thankful for their support and all of their hard work. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Patel, thank you. Mr. Pachi, thank you. Um, you have to be successful, sir. Uh, just watch Mr. Pachi will be very excited. His super is, is catching, <laughs> which tells me that you're doing a job. As far as the foundation is concerned, please feel free to call on us for any help that you need from us thank personally. You. Okay? Thank, you. thank you very, very much. Thank you. We didn't coordinate who was going to start, so I apologize. Um, well, just wanted to say hello and thank you for inviting us to come back again. It's, once again, it's been about a year for us as we've been here as well. Um, I don't know, you may or may not remember, but a year ago we were like the gloom and doom school. <laughs> uh, I hope when you look and see the, what we're presenting tonight, um, there's been a nice shift and, and a turnaround from that. Uh, what we did, rather than put together a whole PowerPoint, we just kind of bullet pointed some accomplishments that the council accomplished this year, uh, which we wanted to um, bring before your attention. The very first one I wanted to note on, because we interviewed and made recommendations regarding our interim principal. Uh, hopefully, you know, next year when the appointment is made final, we can lose that title. But um, I want to make a comment on that. Normally, you know, when new administrators come on, you have that learning curve and a little bit of time to learn each other and to kind of get working together. That was not the case this year. It was from, from, the, from day one, uh, the partnership, the collaboration, the, uh, the relationship, the respect, the, the, the mutual openness was there, and we were able to really get going and get, and get running really from the very beginning between the teaching, teacher representatives on the council, the parent representatives on the council, and the community representatives. So I actually want to thank you guys on behalf of the council for um, giving Sandy the interim position. So. Uh, the second bullet point, um, this is, was one of the gloom and doom last year. We, you'll notice we have achieved, as of tonight, five elected, five out of seven elected parent members. Remember, we have a student body of about 85 to 100. So it's difficult to get the full complement. We don't have 10 to 20 parent volunteers at once. But in addition to that, we have one additional parent um, who is just awaiting that formal election from the parent group. So really, we have six parent representatives right now out of the seven. So I think that's a nice accomplishment. We have two out of two community members, two out of two student members, and five teacher members. So we're almost there. We're one member shy of being a full, complete council. Uh, so I think that was a good accomplishment to, to note off on. We also um, were able to organize with that cohesive group, uh, set an established meeting date, which we had set as the third Thursday of every month. Uh, we consulted on and helped develop a plan for Title I funding for ACE. One of the first things the Governance Council did last year, or maybe even the year before when we first got together, we were, were inquiring about ACE's Title I eligibility. And lo and behold, at one of the first governance council meetings, without even knowing that, Sandy came up and said, guess what, I found out we qualify for Title I funding. And we were like embracing her because we had asked you know, for that to be looked into, and she, um, and she did. So we were able to get going right from the beginning in regards to the Title I funding, and so uh, we, uh, we had worked on a nice collaboration coming up with the plan. So we use Title I funds to try to meet the needs of the students by purchasing 40 Chromebooks, 
15 MacBooks. Uh, we noticed through the, uh, the school improvement plan and from in the past and the data we were looking at that we had a Mac um, need, so we got permission and recommended using uh, some of that Title I funds to, um, to fund a .2 Mac position. We took our .6 and she became a .8. And so uh, that was also helpful. Uh, we've used Title I funds to fund an after-school credit recovery opportunity. Prior to this last semester, um, we had credit recovery as a period during the day. And one of the difficulties with that was, unless the kid passed two credit recovery classes, they didn't gain anything. Because they gained a credit recovery class that they would have a credit for that, but they would have gained credit potentially with the teacher in the classroom anyway. So unless they passed two or more classes, by giving up a period during the day, it didn't make a whole lot of sense. And so we tried to tr see what we would do if we were able to offer it after school and um, along those lines. So that's, we're in, we're in the process right now, thanks to the Title I funds to do that. And we've also um, purchased or printed up uh, community resource directories, which are going to be um, distributed to parents. We brought one copy for Sp Spanish and English to leave with the board. We weren't planning ahead and didn't print up enough copies for the entire board, but you can get an idea of some of the information that we are presenting out. And Sandy, once again, compiled that aspect on it and uh, is actually gonna be bringing it before the council tomorrow night. So it's a really nice nice use there. I'm gonna ju jump in there just for a minute. The, the community resource directories, as many of you know, um, so many of our families uh, really benefit from the resources in our community but really are just not aware of what's available and so um, when I listen to Danbury High School talk about uh, attendance and how do we get all kids we struggle uh, a, a great deal in getting kids to come to school um, but much of the reasons are really in the root cause of why kids don't come uh, and most of the time it's because families need support and so we really thought that the directories, which are uh, in English and Spanish, can provide families those resources in the community, um, from counseling supports to medical supports to uh, a number of different services in the Danbury area. And so we'll be distributing those to every family uh, before the end of school uh, so they can use those and maybe keep those right at their fingertips for uh, any supports they may need. So. And then moving on, um, as part of our task, we continually review the school improvement plan and identify those needs. I alluded to some of those needs, and we were looking at some of the Title I funds, how that was used. Um, but the council advised um, the principal on the best methods of maintaining communication with parents. Uh, we really started emphasizing the use of, uh, the student, of the Power School Parent Portal this year and the Student Portal. Um, that's working nicely. The parents are, a lot of the parents are following along with that. The students are following along with that. The teachers are working together and getting that done. I'm probably one of the worst in making it, make sure it's updated as regularly as I should, but um, it, we, we get there and uh, we're able to communicate the progress as to where the students are at any given point in time. Um, we also are gonna use the school messenger starting next year to know absences. So the a robocall will go out when a kid is absent from school. Uh, to help solidify and just to follow up on the personalized phone calls that the guidance teachers make. We figured too much contact can't be a bad thing. And so we're just going to follow up on that, um, the, automatic, the automated call, because sometimes I can go out earlier than teachers can. Like my prep period is at, one, is at 12.30, so I can't make many phone calls from my absent students until 12.30, 12.45, and so the robocall can go out a lot earlier than that. Um, in addition, um, you know, well, it goes along with the, we, with the consultation on parent engagement and the parent seminar needs. That we uh, looked at a survey, uh, the, and there was a format put in place resulting in um, the workshop, an overview workshop last month, and then a workshop this month and next month centered on positive discipline, which we have some parent involvement on, and we have some parents sign up to participate in that workshop. We also noted the, um, the council noted that one of the keys in success is parent engagement. And at our last governance council meeting, it was suggested that in the fall, in addition to the general open house, we try to do a parent orientation. And to, for, new, for all students, but also particularly for the new students that are coming to ACE, 
And it was noted that Sandy can get up and I can get up and any of the teachers can get up and a lot of the newer parents who aren't familiar with us, they, you know, it's a Charlie Brown talk when the teachers talk. But, um, but so the parent members of the Governance Council actually agreed to put together and to, or, to organize that orientation night. So it's going to be a parent-led, parent-organized orientation night for parents. And so, I think, so we're really excited and hoping that we'll be able to get off the ground in the fall to see how that works. Um, and Sandy consulted uh, regarding the high school redesign grant, personalized learning programs, pathway academies, uh, possible future collaborations with Naugata Valley Community College and Henry Abbott Tech. I know she's met with the tech superintendent. I don't know if you wanted to add anything or if we wanted to. Well, we are continuing to explore the possibility um, of a collaborative with Henry Abbott Technical School. Uh, I had an opportunity to meet with Dr. Torres up in her office in Middletown about a month ago. Uh, she is quite eager. Uh, to form a collaboration, and um, we are in the midst of discussions about possibly piloting uh, an after-school program where students from the Alternative Center could go to Henry Abbott Tech in the afternoons and uh, earn some vocational hours towards a trade uh, that would entitle them to be eligible to enroll in their apprenticeship programs in the evenings. So, uh, that is ongoing discussions. Uh, Dr. Sal is on board. He likes the idea. Um, Dr. Torres likes the idea. Um, I like the idea. And uh, most importantly, the students at the Altern Alternative Center like the idea. So um, we're going to continue to uh, explore that possibility. Um, as well, you know, one of the main goals, one of the main <clears throat> things identified in the needs as district-wide is attendance. Um, we have, you know, attendance problems, no surprise, like other, other schools do. So we did review the attendance data. We looked at the attendance data from the fall, and we compared it with the beginning of the spring. Uh, we recognized that because of the way the attendance reporting formulas changed midway through the semester, we weren't necessarily comparing apples to apples, but we looked to see if we could identify some trends and some patterns there. And, th and then more importantly, we started talking about some suggestions we could maybe use and implement to help improve on the attendance. So some of the suggestions, you know, you know, we're going to talk about, uh, we've talked about trying to implement some guidance group attendance contests to see, you know, maybe get some peer pressure involved in that. Uh, also talked about maybe reinstituting a breakfast of champions uh, for perfect attendance awards, other, some other incentives, as well as maybe even possibly recognizing some VIP status for perfect attendance students, which would allow them maybe some extra privileges, maybe going to the front of the lunch line, things along those lines. Uh, some things that other students may want to buy into and see as a positive uh, incentive to come to school to achieve in addition to just the academic um, incentive and value that sometimes gets overlooked when their kids are out working until 10 o'clock at night, go home, do homework, fall asleep, and you get up in that morning and you know sometimes we go we get up and go to work because we know that we have to and the paycheck is there. Uh, but sometimes we have difficulty going to work in the morning, the kids do as well. And so just to add them the added incentive maybe to help get them out of bed to get them to school is some of the stuff that we're looking at. And then um, we've also reviewed and we're in the process of consulting on the revised ACE contract for success, which is stapled <coughs> to uh, this um, bullet point list here. Um, this is a draft version. We've been looking at it for about two or three months. I know uh, when Ms. Alberts was with us, we were looking at it and talking about it. We made some modifications since she saw it last. And uh, I want to note one of them. Number 10, under the student responsibility, it says A supports a zero tolerance policy regarding any form of bullying and values a safe school climate where all students can learn. That was specifically asked to be included by our student, one of our student representatives on the Governance Council. So, um, you, know, so it's, you can definitely can see the nice collaboration and work that we're doing. You know, the student recommendation was in here, the parent recommendations between the, uh, uh, the, the, the parent orientation and some of the parent engagement aspects. And so the hope and the goal is that we're able to utilize this contract for success and have it also fulfill the school contact requirement, the parent contract requirement, as well as the parent involvement policy. And we kind of just all live seeing it together in one. And the nice thing about it is it's something that we get signatures attached to. And so a copy will be held on school. And it's something we go over when they enter the school. And we'll be able to continue referencing and working on them throughout their career at ACE. So that's a positive. And then the last bullet here, um, as always, we 
we've, began, we've begun to review the school improvement plan that was just submitted to the state um, for the next school year. So this way, hopefully in the fall, uh, we can once again get started with our feet on the ground moving forward and not have to take a whole lot of time preparing. So. Thank you. Um, do you have any questions? that the Board of Education eliminates the current structure of midterms and finals at the secondary level to provide more instructional time and opportunities for authentic assessments and feedback beginning with the 2014-2015 school year in accordance with 14-103. Second. So in the region secondary, do I have, is there any discussion? Michael? Thank you very much. I'd like to read a statement I've prepared which explains for the public and for the record why I, will be not, why I will not be supporting this this evening. For the first time in my short time on the board, I am deeply upset because we are about to make what is not only a bad decision, but a decision which will be detrimental to the students of Danbury. It has also become very rushed. We should have taken the time after last week's meeting to go back to our constituents and to see what they had to say on this subject. A mother who attended the past Danbury High PTO meeting told me the other day that it seems as though we are just rubber stamping this policy. I can't say that I disagree with her. For me, the one con that has been listed outweighs all of the pros combined. Midterms and finals are more than just tests. They are two weeks which help mentally and emotionally prepare you for what will come in college and teach you life lessons. They show students that stress is real, that hard work can pay off, that there are consequences to your actions, they teach you how to prioritize and how to manage your time. If our focus is on preparing students for college, which it should be, we would be taking a step back by eliminating these exams. An academic dean at Southern Connecticut State University recently wrote to me and said, midterms and finals offer students critical moments to reflect, review, and contextualize learning. While these comprehensive moments are not the only tools that offer this opportunity, they are systemic and will continue to be utilized at schools for years to come. College-bound students should understand and be prepared for this experience. While frequent tests may be better for student learning, I don't believe that they will be serving their students to abandon midterms and finals. This was the consensus of all deans at Southern Connecticut State University, the school which is attended by many Danbury High School graduates. I have spoken to many people I know who are recent college graduates, like myself, as well as current students in college, most of whom are also products of the Danbury Public Schools. Common responses I would receive from people ranged from, that's crazy, to what are they thinking? Our very own students are saying this is a mistake. They are the ones who know this better than anyone, better than any K-12 administrator, better than anyone in any level of academia. These are the people we need to listen to because they live this every day. What are we doing to help that 18-year-old incoming <clears throat> college freshman? She's living away from home for the first time. She's in an unfamiliar place and basically knows nobody. Although likely excited for what is before her, she is still extremely scared and very nervous. She goes into her first class and is told that the class consists of just the midterm and a final, which are the only grades for the course. However, this girl has never taken a midterm or a final. She has never had to prepare to take one. She doesn't know the pressure or the process of finals week. She doesn't know what to expect. What a disservice we are doing for that incoming college freshman. If we pass this proposal, what a disservice we are doing for the students of Danbury. Tonight, I choose to stand up for the very students who I am here to represent for it is their futures which are at stake. For these reasons, I urge my fellow board members to join me in putting the future of our students first by voting no on this proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda.
How many other people have questions or statements they'd like to make? I don't know about this. Anybody else? Yeah. I have a statement also. Just um, I, I agree with Michael on uh, some aspects with um, we should inform. Uh, like, like we've done with the like, issues in the past where we've had forums for parents to come out and speak about it and offer their opinions. Because uh, ultimately that's you know who we represent. Um, you know, people, people in the schools. So I, I think that uh, you know, it, it does seem quite, quite rushed to me as well. Um, there's not much information. I mean, I received the information. Unfortunately, it was a surgery, so I couldn't attend the, the workshop. But read up on it, and I think that, like, like a lot of other topics that we've had before, we should put it out there in a, in a, in a public forum of parents. That, that's so. Brady, and thank you. Um, I don't I know if my bike is working up. I just would uh, like to say that um, what Michael said uh, certainly is anecdotal, but um, we had a presentation before the policy committee. We had presentations, I believe, uh, through the city of PTO. Um, we had the presentations and surveys of the staff at the high school and all, and I guess what it comes down to is uh, whose credibility is most important here, the credibility of what Michael has uh, stated or the credibility of the people who work with the students uh, and who have surveyed and I honestly feel have vetted the process. I personally feel we certainly had enough time given the policy committee, given the workshop and all, uh, to hear all the diverse views, which we vetted out here and Michael brought some of these things up uh, at both of the places mentioned. So I don't see we are being rushed, uh, Ralph, uh, honestly, on this. Uh, it's just a question of where do you place the emphasis? Uh, do you go with anecdotal and students and people who are not involved with uh, Danbury High School uh, being the most influential in making a decision like this, or the people who are the professionals who deal with it over the years and have the experience of going through this for well, I don't know how long uh, Mr. Boccaccio is, uh, and I know he probably goes back somewhere in the 80s, I would imagine. <laughs> okay, let's but, not discuss Okay, that. but you understand, you understand where I'm coming yes. from. So I really think it's a question of weighing, you know, which, which one do you feel is really the one that is, um, uh, you know, uh, the most, um, I guess, rational? I, I don't know if I should use that word, the most rational. Uh, and making a decision at the schools. I'm sorry, I didn't have a prepared statement. No, dear. Okay. Richard. Uh, I'd like to call on Gary, Mr. Picaccio, if he could step up and just again, for those members that weren't at the workshop, if you can just walk through your process in terms of, you know, how you came about in terms of the idea, who you spoke to. And then even your, your analytical, as far as, you know, your data to support your recommendation to, to, to eliminate these exams. Essentially, this initiative was, was proposed out of my frustration over the past several years with, with midterms and with final exams. Uh, analyzing the lost instructional time became a great concern to me. Uh, four half days at the end of January and another four half days in June. Uh, eight total days there of lost instruction. And I found that most staff were preparing uh, students in review for anywhere from three to five days, which potentially gave us a loss of 18 instructional days or 10% of any one school year. And over the course of four years, that would amount to 14 and a half weeks of lost instruction. So that was essentially my big, big concern. And I began talking informally to teachers at the school, to administrators, and I found that there was a great deal of support for that. They also had those same concerns. Um, when I spoke to parent groups, one parent very articulately said to me, um, this isn't worthwhile because it's not a teaching or a learning tool. It's not prescriptive, it's not diagnostic. My child takes his final exam in June, a week later gets a report card that has a grade of a 58 or an 84, and doesn't know where they could improve, what they fell down on, what they did well. 
and really and truly, that's very, very important. We give tremendous amounts of tests. We are over-tested in every area. It's incredible the amount of tests that kids take. They're taking benchmarks. They're taking common formative assessments. They're taking unit tests. They're taking quizzes, regular tests. And then externally, they're taking high-stakes tests like SATs, ACTs, advanced placement exams, PSATs, ACUPLACER exams, NACD, NAEP, uh, and the list just goes on and on. Next year it'll be SBAC. In the past it was CAP. They had CMTs. If physically sitting down for two hours and taking a test prepares them for college, I don't see it. And if that's the case, then they've had plenty of practice with CAP and SAT and AP and all of those. <clears throat> You know, the reality is we can do a better job preparing kids for college by teaching them appropriate study skills, by giving them authentic types of assessments that they will have in college. Um, things like, uh, like, like research papers, things like portfolios in the arts, things like oral presentations. These are authentic assessments where we can provide feedback and real learning types of experiences. Eric, could you mention the forums that you spoke to? Yes. Uh, so initially it became my concerns were shared at a December faculty meeting and I invited teachers to come and talk about the subject in January. At that time about 30 staff members uh, came to the library and we spoke for over an hour and we listed all of our concerns, we listed what we thought were the pros. At that point we subdivided into five groups that went out and did research. One group researched what was going on in Connecticut in terms of midterms and finals. Another group researched and contacted universities, universities that we send our students to, um, uh, universities that, that uh, are in our area, and high-powered universities like the Browns and the Harvards and so forth, to make sure that there wouldn't be an impact on admissions to those places. We called the NEASC uh, accrediting agency to make sure that we would talk to them that it would not impact our accreditation. Um, help me out, Megan. We looked at uh, I didn't our have own, a script in front of me. We looked at our own current data and found that there was a 1% uh, difference for the number of students who would pass a course because of that exam or fail a course, so it has a negligible effect, um, if any at all, on uh, the attainment of credit. We also looked at potential alternatives. We are not proposing to eliminate assessments, and we are not proposing to get rid of uh, important opportunities for students to become prepared for college. But the expectations are different. And so what we looked at is how can we leverage the time that we have with students in terms of providing them with high quality instruction and also for assessment opportunities where students can be involved in that process. Uh, we also looked at the current research base. There is absolutely no conclusive evidence that supports that simply having midterm and final prepares a student for college. And if it did, I would posit that we would not have the retention rate issues that we do have in college now. I think that the reality uh, for our students is they have to be prepared for the 21st century, they have to be good collaborators, they have to be problem solvers, they have to be creative thinkers, and they have to play well with others. And you cannot measure those pieces on a midterm and a final. And even if we could, as Gary indicated, we would not be able to use that uh, formatively with students to be able to intervene with them because once they get that grade, it's over. It's an autopsy point at that, at that juncture. There, there's no intervening. And so our roles are to look at the resources that we have, and the most valuable resource, as we heard from the governance councils earlier, is that of time. If the students are with us, they get better. And I have never sat through a testing report where we didn't see that the students who were with us longer, whether it was in the school system, they do better. And so we need the kids longer and we need them in the classroom. And we will continue to assess them, but we will do it in a way that's more meaningful to the learning process so that they are prepared for college. And this information was shared with our faculty who voted, a majority voted to abandon our current structure of midterms and finals. We also shared this with the School Governance Council and the School Governance Council was supportive of this. Uh, we shared this with our PTO. We had a PTO form, and I will tell you that of the 65 or 70 people who showed up, most came in without knowledge, and most came in with the thought that this is a crazy idea, and this is why I'm here. Mm -hmm. But yet at the end of the presentation, when we talked at length about the reasons and the rationale, I would think that the vast majority, and I'm still getting emails today, in support of this initiative that people felt. 
We went to the TDEC committee, the district committee. We went to the board subcommittee. By the way, the TDEC committee is the advisory to the board and they endorsed it. Just so I want We went over to Western Connecticut University and had some forums with students. And interestingly enough, the day that we went over there, after our presentation, they were taking their final exams. And their final exams were oral presentations on research papers that they had done. And the vast majority of students that we talked to in education said, our assessments are really authentic assessments like oral presentations, research papers in social studies, <coughs> portfolios in the arts, and that kind of thing. Um, we also vetted and we also met with student focus groups. And of course, students talked about the stress that they endure, talked about the fact that they don't get feedback on the test, and it's really not a learning tool. And, and they were very much in favor. My seniors are coming to me saying, why did you wait so long? Why couldn't you have done it this year? Uh, so, you know, we, as I said, we had the opportunity for parents to speak out at the PTO. There was a board workshop here. This evening, there's no one here to speak about it. Um, I sent a robocall inadvertently home, um, you know, indicating that there was support. And it's been on the agenda tonight. Um, so, you know, we feel that we've spent a, a good four or five months talking about this to all of the vested people and getting the message out, and it's clear that people know about it, and the feedback that I'm getting is very positive. Um, thank you, Gary. Yes, sir. I applaud you for your, your recommendation. I always have trouble with this. Excuse me. I applaud you for your recommendation uh, as to what you brought to the board and what you're proposing here. Education is changing radically. It's changed in the last two or three years uh, tremendously. Assessments, grading, and how you interpret them uh, has also changed. I think we have to go with a, a bold type of decision to go with the changes to use the buzzwords 21st century skills. And I think we have to evaluate this and go with it. Um, I was reading recently that in terms of some universities, Harvard University has some 297 classes out of some 13, 1400 that only give midterm. SUNY uh, Albany, no, I'm sorry, business. SUNY and Albany have done away with it. Hampshire College up in Amherst, Mass, has been in college for years. That's never a four year college. That's never given tests. Um, many cities in the United States are leaning uh, lean toward this type of a proposal. I think Denver is in the forefront for doing this, and I really think that there'll be a lot of people falling behind us and, and marching with us on this particular um, uh, proposal that we're, we're voting, that proposal that you're offering and the decision that, that we have to make. As to the stress of taking tests, every day in life is a stress. So, I mean, I'm not even going to, to even discuss stress or whether uh, a, a test gives you stress or this is the bus in the morning you just stress about that. But I'm in favor of it and like everything else, we'll work hard to, to, to make it work and we just go with the times in, in not doing the same old thing. Keeping the, as many hours in front of a student is, is the most important thing. It's been our policy here to keep teachers on the payroll in terms of cuts We've never cut any, any staff, and I think this supports the policy of the board and the education curriculum that we want as many hours in front of these students to, to learn. So thank you very much. Does anyone else have a question or comment on the board? Richard? Gary, just to be clear, this does not impact the AP courses? No. They okay. still take AP exams. Last year, 78% of the students went on to, to secondary education? Yes, sir. Of those, how many took an AP course? Any percent? Did you have a percentage? I can't tell you off the top of my head. Um, we have some 800 students now taking AP. Of those, I can't tell you the exact number of seniors. So clearly, in terms of preparation, whether it be through the AP or PSATs, SATs, you know, you're comfortable that they, that they are prepared should a college offer midterms and finals. Yes. Okay. May I ask how long you've been an educator, Mr. Bradford? This is my 40th year, and I'm proud to say all in Danbury. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have a comment or a question? I just, I just need to lend my support to it. I've been quiet about it, but I've supported it since the beginning. 
I think the board has, I think Michael's points are made, we've con had conversation. Um, we can go either way on that, but in fact, you need to keep the focus on what we think is best for the youngsters. Take an exam is good. Uh, I, f I believe what we're proposing makes for a better teaching tool for our students. We'll prepare them for the time post high school. The triangulation between time, good assessment, and best practice is what we've been working on. This puts it there. Um, I don't want to go right or wrong answers because they're value. But if you would look at me and ask me which way to go after my 44 years, um, and being primarily the secondary, this type of structure that we have has been, we've always done it. It's good to do. It provides an opportunity for students to move their grades if they need it. I will tell you, out of 34,000 grades that were given last year, one, less than 1% 1 of grades actually moved either way uh, for a student. So did it really impact the students? The preparation and time that teachers put into that final exam for 20% does not equate to the kind of value the youngsters are going to get when they take the same exam and testing during the quarter. I think the board has a real uh, tipping point here. It's not being first in the country. It's not being first in Connecticut. You need to do what's right for our kids. And we really feel deeply that's the right thing to do for our youngsters. And we'll better prepare them to face what they have at the, uh, yes. the post-secondary. Okay. And, and as far as the parents and people being pre prepared to address that, I would like to address that, is we have the last presentation, which has been sitting on our website since it went on last week. Um, it was vetted through all of these administrators that worked so hard. If you were here, you would see that they all gave concern. Michael's concerns were well met that night. Um, I sat on the, um, I sat in the middle until that evening, but that's how the, the presentation went. They convinced him. Um, they convinced him. Um, and, and it's been before the public for months in, in different ways. And um, people are trusting the way they trust, right, people. the way they trust these people to take care of their children and to educate their children. Um, they don't have input in every single thing. But they're there, and they never do anything without telling you way ahead of time. I won't say never, but you know, usually. Alrighty. There's no other conversation I'd like to move to a vote, please. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Any abstentions? Harris, motion carries. It's done. That the Board of Education authorize the use of building rental funds to enter into contract with school due for facilities slash utility software in accordance with 14-104. With an explanation of school due, please. Thank you. <laughs> Certainly. Uh, school due is a uh, nationwide product that it's obviously used by schools to measure all different things from like um, IT ticketing, uh, work tickets, uh, facility work tickets. What we are exploring the purchase of tonight is the uh, facilities tracker for um, building rentals. So for example, if uh, a parent or someone wanted to use the school, they can go on and there's an online form to put on the pieces that they need. That is then submitted electronically to our rental department, then approved by the principals. So there's a, there's a process, an electronic way to do that. The utility portion is actually a way that we can take our utility bills, load it electronically into their software, and actually drill down based on uh, degree days of temperature, uh, benchmarking against other schools, similar age, energy star. Um, this is a little bit what I talked to the council about a couple weeks ago. We've been exploring this option for a while, so I think it's, I think it's a really uh, worthwhile and kind of some shocking information based on what we've done here in the past few years. Any questions? Richard? Um, I mean, what's the payoff? What's the cost? What's the payoff in terms of timeline? Payoff for the, the rental piece will be actually to better charge back costs, to better assess hours on buildings for heat and, and, and usage from the rental side. The energy side is in a sense to find problematic buildings. Like right now, we know Pembroke School burns excessive amounts of heating oil as an example. We might have different issues with electricity and natural gas in other schools, but drilling into those bills is a lot more complicated in a sense heating oil numbers and benchmarking those. So it gives you the ability to do that also you can take a building that let's say is a 1960 vintage 
and benchmark that square foot against where our building should be and against the Energy Star efficiency. So we could say, well, maybe the windows in that school need to be replaced, the payback is greater. There's a lot more uh, utility data we can extract out. It also allows them to do more forecasting for budgets. So there's a lot of benefits on both. The facility side is nice because a building principal or even us at the central office, if we had an emergency in a school, and let's say it was after school, we can actually go on and know which, which rental group is in that location, you know, a contact information for them. Um, so it gives us a lot more vision into what's happening in the schools. So there's, there's, there's multiple paybacks. I think also we get off a lot of paper forms we're doing now for the rental fund stuff. So it's, it's got a, quite a few benefits. Good. Anyone else with any questions? No? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Carries. All right, what we're going to do is we're going to digress for a second, guys. I have people, we have people sitting in the audience that really need to be taken care of. Yes. And if it's all right with everybody, I'd like to go to information. Um, a, which is Rogers Park Middle School, script to Puerto Rico on January 15th, 2015. I take this as the contingent from Rogers yes. Park. Yes. Yes. <laughs> My, uh, it's okay. Okay. T shirts, by the way. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Pat Stevens, Rogers Park, uh, Spanish language teacher. And uh, these are some of our students that were on our seventh annual trip to Puerto Rico this year. And after seven years, I figured you're tired of hearing from me. So these students have um, volunteered to join us this evening and answer any questions that you might have. Um, if it's okay, I'm gonna pass this around and Please. ask each student to give you their name and what their favorite time was that we had there and and any questions please feel free. Thank hey, you. Hey, you want to start? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> we don't play. We are really like. Hi, I'm Taya. Um, my favorite part of the trip was the rainforest because I like traveling around the rainforest because it was my first time and I thought it was really interesting. Okay. I'm Shivani, and my favorite part was my birthday party. It was a surprise, and at first I missed my family, but then I realized my family was with me. Okay. Can I have a second job? Um, part of what Shivani didn't tell you was Mother Nature played a little trick on us this year, and we ended up um, having two additional days in Puerto Rico um, because the our, our flight was canceled, and um, we found out when we had just gotten off the kayaks, we were soaking wet at about 10 o'clock at night, and we're like, what do you mean we're not going home tomorrow? But anyway, the day that we were there was actually Shivani's birthday, and her colleagues here um, managed to keep her occupied all day, and um, we went. We hired some life bars and went to the beach in the morning with the January birthday baby isn't going to get to go to the beach in the morning. and. Uh, then we kept her busy in the afternoon while everyone decorated our place and kind of put together a big surprise party for Shalani and ended up being kind of neat. And so it was exercise, you always remember it, Mom. Always, always, always. Great. Um, my favorite part about Puerto Rico was going to the school and shadowing with the kids there. But how was it different? Was it really different than Rogers Park? Um, you yeah. Had to go well, because their school, it didn't have any hallways. It was all outside. And in January, we can't really go outside much. So. And what was the gym like? What was the gym like? In January. But did you go, you know, you remember where the basketball court was? By the place where we got the, the, the frosty? That was the gym. Oh, that was the gym. You didn't go to gym. You didn't have gym that time? No, they had it last week. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Peyton, and my favorite part was kayaking in the bioluminescent bay. What is, what is the bioluminescent bay? Uh, it was a whole bunch of microorganisms. microorganisms, and like when you stuck your hand in or your paddle, they would blow up, and it was really cool. <laughs> and it was pitch black, so. Excellent. 
<laughs> my name is Daniel, and uh, my favorite part of the trip would probably be the art museum in Ponce. I found it very interesting to see the vast pieces of art that they had accumulated throughout the years and how it changed along with their culture. Excellent. Very good. It's nice that you appreciate that too. That's very nice. Yeah, and I think you have a copy of our itinerary from the past year in, in your packets. And we really do try to have a broad range of activities for the students to do. We um, did get to go again to Dr. Selta's farm, which is a sustainable organic farm, which was fun. And we chewed on some sugar cane. Yeah, and um, their neighbors actually run a hydroponic farm. The prior year, our students got to see them putting together the tubing for the hydroponics. And this year, we actually did see some lettuce growing and how the, the system goes in the hydroponic farm, which is very neat. Um, we attended school, we went to an art museum, we went to um, the sugar cane, the Castillo de Serrillet. So we really tried to do a very broad range of activities for the students to see um, culture and different Science, social studies, touch on all of it. Social studies, science, art, culture, etc. And the language thing of Spanish. <laughs> Had to order the meals in Spanish because otherwise you got a little hungry. <laughs> um, so that's it. Do you have any questions that any of us can answer? There'll be a question, Justin. So I was just wondering uh, is it a different group of students going or? Uh, he says 22 students and all know it. It seems like it's a very worthwhile trip. I was just wondering, as you've been doing this a few this, years. These, these students were from our, our seventh year, and then um, next year we'll be looking for the seventh. Students who are currently in seventh grade this year, they'll be in eighth grade next year. To um, We'll offer the trip to them and see who comes forward is interested in going. And um, it's usually a very varied and unique group. And a lot of the students didn't necessarily know each other before. We're a very broad, uh, large school. And some students, their, their paths didn't necessarily cross before that. And now they're sharing chairs and things like that. <laughs> so basically, so, basically you know, like we had 21 and 22 go last year. Mm -hmm. and, and so it would be a different 21 yes. and 22. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. No, that's yes. wonderful. That's the idea. Absolutely. There'll be a, many having an opportunity. That's yeah. great. Any other questions? It's on for information tonight. Yes, for information tonight, yes. Alright, it's information. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for doing this. 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 Thank you. That the Board of Education authorized the use of building rental funds to enter into contract with school due for facilities slash utility software in accordance with 14-104. I second. There you go. Now, we'll vote. Okay. And it carries unanimously. Okay. Next one. All right. Next one. That the Board of Education authorizes the Superintendent of Schools to submit Form ED-099 to the Connecticut State Department of Education, stating that the Board will participate in Section 3 of Connecticut General Statute Section 10-215F in accordance with 14-105. Second. Moved and seconded. Any conversation, discussion, questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. 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 Did the Board of Education allow the sale to students of that the Board of Education allow the sale to students of any legal foods not listed in Section 3 of Connecticut General Statutes Section 10-215F at all co-curricular sponsored events such as sporting events, school performances, school dances, PTO-sponsored events, theatrical productions, 
and school fairs provided that the exemption criteria are met. Second. Well, um, any discussion? These are basic, uh, you yeah, know, just a comment. I think basically these are the policies we've been following. Right. right. The motion right. permits, right. The, they couldn't do it unless the board did this motion. Right. That's all. That's right, yes. Healthy food. Yeah. Okay. Seeing no uh, further discussion, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? All right, next. Yeah. We're going into. What happened to the Spin Ranch The Healthy Foods Exemptions? We did that. We did that. Yeah, it just was an explanation of that. It was just an explanation. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, you may recall last, was it last meeting? We had a gentleman talk about, about the, the high school. Right. Gary has followed up and we went through all of that. Um, and um, that was primarily uh, in the, uh, as you exit the high school off of Eastgate. Um, we have more students who live in that sector and uh, there's no busing. So, Parents drive their students to the school, drop them off, and they return. So uh, Gary went down with the police, and they did some enforcement. There wasn't anything done illegally, so you really couldn't enforce. You just advised folks in terms of where to drop off kids, so we are monitoring that. We also had Jack and Giegler up to talk about the uh, other complaints that we get regarding drop-offs in front of school and things of that nature. So we, we were reviewing the procedures up there. She came in uh, last week to the cabinet, and some years ago, when she headed the um, getting that light that, that has been on Beckley Road, right? Beckley. 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 They could. They they had a uh, comprehensive study. Like she said. So we're looking for those recommendations because we want to look at some egress possibilities, and we're thinking maybe it could be incorporated in that report instead of replicating the report to see if there's some things that we can do. We are growing at high school. You all know that. So, you know, uh, more parents are driving their kids. I mean, there's kids on the bus, there's kids uh, being dropped off. But you have the unusual situation of a very busy highway, and um, uh, young, it just comes together at that one time in the morning. No problem in the afternoon. Seldom hear problems, even when we have large events. It's in the morning we're having that issue. So we'll keep working on it. I just wanted you to know that we're doing, doing that. Um, Allergens regulations, uh, we, I put some things in your folder there, mm -hmm. and you know, we, we've tried to uh, kind of listen to some of the things we talked about, and we made some adjustments. Uh, I'll have Kathy quickly uh, do that. We don't need to revisit the entire thing, but there were some ones that we had conversations about that I think we can make some modifications on. Good evening, everyone. Uh, oh, you did get the underlying group. Did you? Great, because my copy did. Thank you. No, you did. Yeah, mine didn't show up. Yeah, you got that. Yeah, would you just mention what you said? Yeah, you got that. 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 Yeah, you got just very briefly, uh, the the policy itself is not changing at all. It is the regulations that have the proposed changes. No, I'm just talking to them. Speaking okay. to them. Thank you. Um, it's uh, the regulations that the proposed changes are taking place. And uh, the main change that uh, is being proposed is the elimination of outside food from monthly classroom celebrations. Um, we are proposing that alternatives, such as extra recess, uh, an activity, a game, a guest reader, uh, be used for those monthly celebrations. However, uh, at the elementary level, the students are permitted to bring a snack of their own every day, and if the teacher chooses to use that time for the celebration, the children may have their own snacks. But there will be no outside food brought in by parents, as we have had before. Uh, the celebrations will continue. They are not being eliminated. Uh, we're just suggesting that it be done in a different way. Uh, in terms of anything curriculum-based with the world language studies, um, that will not be eliminated, but any uh, child that has a food allergy, a permission slip will go home. Um, we've determined that the nurses will not be checking the food anymore, that only uh, the parent of a food allergic child should be the one to determine what's safe for their child to have. Uh, so that would be something that would be new. And that's really the main changes that we're looking at. Are you happy with the regulations? 
Pardon me? Are you happy with the regulations? I am. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. And clarification. I usually don't need them every day. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I just have a very quick um, question clarification about the, um, you had mentioned the parent permission slip and you had mentioned the course world languages, I think. Mm -hmm. Which is, I would assume, like a middle school middle or school high school. school. Right. My question is, you know, I teach fourth grade, and one of my um, science units is digest the digestive system, nutrition, and diet. And we love this unit, and the unit teaches kids how to read food labels, teaches kids what a healthy meal is, what a healthy meal would look like, um, how to have a healthy breakfast, what's included in that, and um, what does a portion size look like and looking at foods and looking at portion sizes and my question is would these regulations stop me in my classroom from and if I have a child in my classroom who has a severe um, allergy to any foods we tend to bring foods into the classroom during that um, unit and it's an amazing unit of study and the kids love it and we've even had feedback from parents saying that because of your unit of study, my, my son or daughter is making better choices and even having healthier breakfasts because of what you've taught. And so to me, that unit, um, we brought in foods and we've even tasted foods in my classroom, um, exposing kids to some very healthier choices that maybe they weren't exposed to before. But before that happened, we, I would speak to parent if the parent there was one in my classroom of a child who had a, a severe allergy and we would only have foods in the classroom that that child could, you, could eat um, and that was a conversation I had with the parent and we made sure that the parent was a everything was approved by the parent if the child had food allergies. Would I be able to continue to do that under these regulations? Yes, if it's in the curriculum and the, in our case, it will be a written permission form. Okay. As an elementary form. school teacher, I just want to yes, it okay. is part of their curriculum. The only but thing that changed change is that we made it K-12. You made a what? It's K-12, yes. that permission. permission. It was, you may remember, we made that adjustment. Yeah, okay. It is K-12, so no, we that adjustment. Um, but we do want the written permission. Absolutely. And it's the teacher's responsibility to obtain it. And if a teacher chooses not to do that type of That's activity fine. in their classroom, they don't have to. But if one does, this it allows them to with that written permission yeah. slip. Yeah. I think that's amazing. That's the way it should have happened anyway. <laughs> so that those are right. So we're just going to keep them there. And we'll, do is, we'll put some articles out. Um, that Robin's back here, and she's doing a newsletter. Robin, why don't you stand up? She's the one who's been doing the newsletters. Robin Brogan, she's the one that's been doing the details for and the uh, press releases. So we'll, we'll, we'll get that out to the folks. So thank you very much. And then, we'll give you. We just went to a budget meeting, so this should be short, short and sweet. The finance committee just met um, to kind of update the board on our current budget procedures. We did um, receive from the City Council last month our, our budget uh, decrease. The current approved budget right now increase is $3,286,000. Primarily the cuts are a result of some open positions at our new uh, West Side campus, uh, a reduction at the high school level, some additional retirement savings, and the bulk of the increase decreases. Health insurance cuts for $660,000. Uh, additional health insurance savings in the West Side campus because of projections we made for new hires. Athletic insurance, some supply reductions at the middle school, the middle school level, and heating and fueling reductions at the uh, district wide. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Joe? Alrighty, seeing none. Uh, Okay, no this is exciting. No Pathways in technology. Uh, the board knows for the past few years we've been working on middle college. The new terminology is early college. That's what Connecticut refers to call it. Um, we uh, have 
created an articulation agreement with um, Nagata. And um, that will begin as a pilot next year. Um, since that meeting we had about a month ago, some things have happened in Connecticut where um, higher ed has um, done some work in the Norwalk area with, um, is it 3M? Help me out. What is it, GM? Yeah, yeah. With IBM. With IBM, either one. With IBM, thank you. And um, where they're really going to start up a, uh, a program with courses and a pathway to uh, uh, various uh, various interns and even jobs when they uh, when they leave uh, the uh, program. Um, the program I'm looking at um, would be similar, and I called the commissioner and wondered where was Denver. You know, it's like um, what happened here. Um, the question, you know, why were we considered? Um, well, we need to consider. So last Friday we met at Naugatuck with the president of the college along with about eight of our, our members and their deans. And we agreed to move forward and uh, the state is looking at actually funding us to half a million dollars to begin a program which will not begin next year because of the planning department in, in, at the magnitude that I wish, but next year we will pilot. The dream here is that in the, in the event um, when we do start this, you will see students matriculate from 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade, and when they leave, can actually leave an associate's degree. So they will be dual enrolled. They'll have experiences with companies. Albert's here because his company really um, has been at the forefront in providing 100 interns, I could say, positions. And he lives in Denver, and I'd like to have him here, <laughs> which is great. He's also on the council at the high school. I mean, for our kids, uh, it's what we need to do. They can leave high school with a pathway to a four-year university, they can lead to a two-year university, they can go to work. Um, all of those things are at their uh, behalf as long as um, we start them down this right path. The area is the area of study. We're looking at the Allied Arts. Um, there's manufacturing is a real big thing in Connecticut, so we're trying to determine uh, which area that we would develop. We have one of the best um, programs with um, Help me, it's, I call it a hospital program, but it's health, health, and bioscience. health and biosciences that we wish That's to build on. <laughs> health and biosciences. The problem there is to find enough quarters for students to go into. So when we start this next year, it'll be a small program, but a uh, year from next September, we can actually start with our first special call group to, uh, to move through here. Really well. I apologize for this bird walk. Um, we, have, uh, we had an issue at the high school. Not that bad issue, just something did we do the teacher evaluation item? We no, not yet. We were going. Oh, okay. Um, just that there's a lot of excitement around this concept. And one reason that we were looking at this, as you know, is because of the overcrowding and all that. But this, this entire concept has really caught fire, I think, in the community. Everywhere we go, people are excited about it. And I know Sal has done a lot of work with the president from Nogata. And I think they've built a strong relationship upon which we can build. And the, the tricky part is just to operationalize it, so we're working our way through um, layer after layer after layer of this because the logistics are mind boggling, trying to move kids and so on and so forth. Last thing, please, I went to a, a, a meeting with a, I serve on a board, and there was a representative um, from one of the health communities, probably the best way to say it that way, who said we're very interested in partnering with Danbury on ramping up your health and bioscience academy which is really exciting to us because our vision is to take 60 kids and make it 120 or possibly 200. And if we could move students off campus into locations where they really want them and we downsize by a couple hundred kids and then we have to operationalize the PTEX program, um, it wonderfully, it just wonderfully it provides so many more opportunities for children and families. So I just think it's a great idea. You're going to hear a lot more about it, but Albert, did you want to mention something? The reason why, because uh, I think we need to hear from the industry anything, you want to add to it? I mean, really the intent here was to partner public with private and nonprofit and to ensure that the students that graduated really were graduating with something that business wanted, as opposed to just, you know, degrees that, you know, candidly, you know, we were less interested in. So the focus here is on STEM. 
specifically it's looking to target how do we get both internships as well as mentoring. So as mentioned, I was actually down with the governor in Norwalk when this was announced. Uh, I'm the site executive at IBM Southbury. Uh, I've committed to help find 100 mentors at IBM to pair up with the students. And the intent is, you know, wherever we do this elsewhere, we have 16 in New York, five in Chicago, a couple in Idaho. New York's just agreed to expand it further. The governor of Connecticut said we're going to do all the community colleges, 11 or 12. And we want to pair them up with mentors. We want to pair them up with internships. So when they graduate, they graduate with something that industry wants, and we want them to be first in line to get those jobs. Uh, well, thank you. Well, thank you. Yes. Thank you, sir. But thank you, school. Bill and South. This is amazing. Howard, thank you. Thank you. That's the most well. exciting thing I think I've heard here in 100 years. OK. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry. Oh. Okay. I, 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 I forgot. Just, yes. <laughs> so, so sorry. when do you think this will be rolled out? What year? If it were this year, next year we have a pilot. Of a pilot that this starts September this coming. September yes. to be a pilot. It's a pilot. It's a pilot program beginning the articulation mm -hmm. agreement, but starting with 11th graders. Oh, with 11th graders. That's right. Graders. It's different. That's starting the early college at 11th grade. The program that we're talking about with the funding will start as 9th graders a year from September, a year from this so coming. So the current 8th, the current 7th graders. graders would have the opportunity, opportunity to select when that's they correct. get to ninth that's grade, correct. and their selection would be. But what, what are they selecting? Whether or not they want to be in the health. That, well, what I said, we're trying to. That's what the planning has to be. A lot of it will be determined. Will we have the internships? Will we have the opportunities? That's what we have to do. Thanks. But it'll be one of the two. Thanks. Yeah, it's 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 wonderful. It's wonderful. Awesome. It's why we hired you. Okay. Next. Okay. Next on the agenda, uh, I just lost my mind. But let's go. Keep going right down into information Please cell. Speak into the microphone. Oh, I, I don't have it. I gave it to Sal. I have it back now. Is that better? Okay. Close that, guys. I get yelled at. Okay. It's getting late. It's moving along <laughs> quickly. It's a quarter to nine. So could you spit out on the ass? We want to we want to run the teacher evaluation, Bill. Yes. You want to go back? Yeah, yeah we have to go back. It's important on the presentation. B. Because that was against Bill Hammond's on. I will make this brief because um, we've gone over this many times. And I also am sensitive to your time and the time of night. Um, as soon as you have this handout, let me just explain it. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, great. I want to make sure that this doesn't come out like, uh, it, it come out rather that we're over resourcing one school and um, adequately resourcing another, or under-resourcing one. And so um, what, what I'm suggesting, and the work that this board actually has done, and you heard from the High School Governance Council, for example, the strength of the deans and the climate specialists and the work that they have done. What this top sheet is designed to do, we shared this with the Teacher Evaluation Committee yesterday. Oh, we, we shared this with the Teacher Evaluation Committee yesterday. And um, you'll understand how this works in a moment. If you look at Danbury High School, top left quadrant, you'll see that it has 210 certified staff members. These are approximate numbers, and 3,000 students. If you look to the right, you'll see Park Avenue School with 40 certified staff members and 600 students. So we sat down and went through a little exercise. We've been doing this a lot lately. And we said, and if you remember Bob's work, with the committee from the very beginning, his, his primary concern was do we have enough um, administrators to really implement, operationalize the uh, evaluation plan. So if you look at Danbury High School, one principal, one associate principal, four assistant principals, nine department heads who can do observations. When you look at Park Avenue, it's one principal, one assistant principal. 
When you look at support, high school, two deans, one climate specialist, two police officers, two school resource officers, six safety advocates. When you look at Park Avenue, one safety advocate. So we sat down, we did the ratio of just people who can evaluate up against the number of teachers. And at Danbury High School, not counting the deans, climate specialists, police officers, safety advocates, you're looking at one evaluator per, four t per 14 certified staff members. And at Park Avenue, it's one evaluator per 20. It becomes magnified when the two administrators this coming year at Park Avenue have an issue in the building that might involve parents, uh, where they need the deans to go do home visits or deal with issues in the building, where they, need, they have a climate issue, where there, there might be a disciplinary issue that becomes pretty extreme. It typically doesn't happen at the elementary level, but there are no police officers, no climate specialists, no deans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Sal and I met with the elementary principals a while back, and the concern we had is really twofold. Um, one major concern from Sal's point, Edward Bob's point, that will the elementary principals actually be able to do this without ignoring every other part of their responsibility? The teacher evaluation committee said, we're going to do it, and then folks, we're going to do it every other year. We're going to directly evaluate a teacher year one and do these things called minis or walkthroughs year two. And then year three, we evaluate, year four, we do these, and they tie us back and forth. The committee decided that, so in, from my perspective, and it certainly sounds too, in addition to being concerned about whether or not the principals could actually do this, we also didn't want to override the committee. We put almost a 30-member team in place to think their way through this. They spent two years doing this, looking at state law, and on and on and on. And so what we did was we asked the elementary principals to come in and meet with us, and we did the metrics with them, played it out. And to a person, they said, we can't do this. We can't do this in the event that you want us to continue to work with parents, work with disciplining students, work with the bus company, and so on and so forth. So we went back to the committee yesterday, and we shared this information with them, and we said, there's a strong belief that this is not doable. And they agreed. And so the question then was, so what do we do about it? If you turn the page, please. We developed a solution as a small group. You've heard um, Harry Ross Valley, Chris Cross, uh, Bruce Gomes, Karen Casimiro, the IDT as we, we were known, the Instructional Development Team. We created a model that we thought would work. And then we brought that model to the Teacher Evaluation Committee. And we said, this is just a thought. They supported it to 100%. And they vote on all items. And we have to have a super majority. 100 people, 100% 100 of the people on the team felt this was appropriate. So let me very briefly walk you through, because you've heard much of this before. Terms, formal evaluation means there's a pre-conference, which typically takes um, almost a period, or at least 30 minutes, a formal observation, and then a post-conference, which could take another half hour, or almost a full period. Informal evaluation only has an observation of the class. Walkthroughs, which are also known as minis, run from 10 to 20 minutes typically. Most of our elementary principals are in every bill, in every classroom every day. The state law says you must have at least three per year on each staff member. They could probably do three per week and finish that piece, so it's not an imposition for them. And then there's something new that we haven't really talked about. The state just solidified this is called end of year review. And the end of year or review of practice simply means those teachers who have served in informal leadership roles, serving as mentors, serving on the teacher evaluation team, serving on TDEC, serving as workshop presenters outside the building, that leadership will be captured this way. So what that materializes into and what we're sharing for information tonight, and then we have to come back to the board and as an action item in order for us to submit our plan, put on that Board of Education approves the plan for submission. Um, May 20th or June 2nd, there are two windows that we're going to do it. Um, so the, what we came to yesterday was, it's actually a three-year cycle, but it repeats, so that's why years four and five are there. We do year one for teachers who are deemed to be proficient, who are beyond fourth-year teachers. They've come to full tenure. We do one formal evaluation, two minis, and an end-of-the-year review. For year two, we do three minis and end-of-the-year review. For year three, we do three minis and end of the year review. And then we flip back to one formal, 
three minutes, three minutes, one. So it becomes a three-year cycle, which is the identical cycle that we created 10 years ago because we couldn't operationalize the plan. We don't have enough you know, uh, administrators to be able to do it. So 100% of the, of the committee members felt comfortable about it. I want to thank uh, Mr. Tabersack for being there. Again, you know, he's been a valuable resource. I want to thank the union leadership on both teachers' union and administrators' union. It's been very amicable. Um, I want to thank the teachers and the administrators who have come. Uh, ye yesterday, we asked them to come. We asked them to come the day before on Monday. Can you come on Tuesday? And we had almost 100% of the committee members who were there. Um, the few people that weren't were working, and that's certainly understandable. So um, we feel that we've gotten it right. And the very last thing is we vetted this through our curriculum council, through Jonathan Cox, who's doing a strategic plan. And we had a team that went up to Litchfield today on a related issue. And again, Danbury came out as being the front runners on this. So before we did anything, ask you for an action item. You could, if you wanted to tonight, turn it into one. Or if you want to think about it, you could do it next time as well. Any questions for Dr. Bless? Informal was um, something that we had. Thanks, great question. Um, informal, we had two options. And the other option, if you look at the current one that you're looking at, it would have year one as is, year two as is, year three instead of three million, we insert informal. And, and so there'd be no pre and post. But as we talked about it, it was, we could not operate. It was still too much stress on the building principles when they don't have all the other support. So we left that out. We still have the term informal in our plan, which we're allowed to go and do an informal observation if we wish we want to do the pre and the post. But typically we do that because there was some need and we wanted to give the teacher more feedback. So your informals require pre and post? No. Okay, they don't. So if you're doing three minis throughout the year, which could be 10 minutes to 20 minutes each, that's 60 minutes possibly in a classroom throughout 10 minutes or 20 minutes each or three times a year. Um, or could you opt to have just a informal? Could it be one or the other instead of, it's the same amount of time that a principal has to be in a classroom, whether they do three minis or one formal, of which probably 45 minutes. So it's the same amount of their time, but could, is there an option? And is, is that, because I know this happens in my classroom, mm -hmm. And I, this is what's happening to me. I have my informals. There's four of them in my, throughout the, not informals, minis, what you call minis. And there's sometimes just, you would like the principal to stay a little longer, to have seen the entire lesson, and not just 10 minutes of it or 15 minutes of it as a pop-in. And I'm wondering how teachers feel about that, mm -hmm. and if, if, if it could be one or the other. So that way you can have that choice. And, you really want the principal to come in and see your reading lesson because you like the way it was developed, but they're only coming in for 10 minutes, they're only seeing a portion of it, and they haven't seen how you opened your lesson or closed your lesson. Um, I'm just throwing that out there because well, I know it's been this better every day. Than okay. I, can, I can tell you that we, we've talked about that for over a year. Okay. Um, so the, the short answer is, is this. We backed into the state statutory language. The okay. State Board of Education just met we just got this yesterday, May 13th. They took, they accepted the peak recommendations. In the state plan, it says a teacher sh a deemed to be proficient shall be evaluated no less than once every three years, okay. and in the interim years shall have no less than three mini observations. Oh, yeah. I can tell you right now, in the vast, vast majority of our schools, um, when we talked to the elementary principal teachers, they said my principal was in like a couple times a week, mm -hmm. so. Though we get a lot more traction from a mini because it's over time I'm seeing you every single week. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. And as the principal is coming around, first of all, they try to vary the times yeah. intentionally. Sometimes it's Sarah did this because there's a parent issue and they, they check the chains. And the other time we have frequently we have teachers saying, uh, just we uh, talked about one of our, we just talked to one of our principals the other day who said, it's very typical for me to go into a class when the teacher says, I'm struggling with the reader's workshop model, and can you watch and give me some feedback? And the principal will actually take over the lesson at that point. Um, that, ha that has happened very frequently. So I don't mean to dismiss it in any way. It's certainly 
your points are not only well taken, we've thoroughly done that. And that is at the heart and soul of our plan. Bob will, will tell yeah, you. That. Uh, just on that, that what you brought up, uh, what you just brought up, uh, was brought up at the uh, council. And uh, the way I understood it was a teacher could always ask right. for yes. extended informal. And okay, and that, but that was the same question that was brought up, and that was, and, and, and the answer was yes. Okay, if you if you wanted, you had a great lesson. Like as a teacher. You know, I knew when I really put something together, we like somebody to see it. Okay? All right. And, and in deference to everybody here, because um, it's a very long night, and it, it kind of is to be, and thank you very much for the presentation. How comfortable are we to make a motion to put this on the agenda right now? Or would you rather peruse it and read it over for another two weeks and vote on it next time? And I'm going to leave that to the board. We'll start at Michael. Yes or no with, with moving tonight or not? Because I, I don't want to rush anybody, that's what I'm saying. I would take two weeks. You would take just two to weeks. Go. I'm fine with it. Oh, I'm fine with it. Richard. Fine with it. I'll do the job. Fine with it. Yeah. Like what? I'm fine with it. Okay. Fine with it. Okay. So then we're going to add, I'm going to add that, an item to the agenda. Is that how is this done? Well, we need agenda? a motion, a motion to please. add an item to the agenda. So, and then could I hear a motion to add an item to the agenda, please? I move that we add uh, the uh, item to the agenda. Item to the and agenda. item to the agenda. Okay, it's seconded by Ralph. All in favor? Aye. 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 May I hear the motion, please? I should say opposed. Oh, I'm sorry, do I have an opposed? Yes, I have to say no. Right? <laughs> 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 you don't have to say no. I'm oh, giving you the opportunity no, I'm to support the move in it. Okay. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to vote for it, too. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what we vote. But you could then. Only one no night. Only one no night. Okay, uh, can we see your motion? The motion would be to accept the teacher, the teacher evaluation slash professional development plan has presented to the board. Do I hear a second? Second. Uh, for submission to the state department. For submission to the state department. Is it got everything in it now? You sure? Do you feel comfortable? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, moving right along. I have a second. Is there any more discussion? Second. Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. And we had a second self second game on that one for Bob. Okay, thank you. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any abstentions? Any no's? Thank you. Motion thank you very much. Good job, Bill. Thank you. There you go. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Okay, we have, if, if everyone will stop talking for a minute, and listen. Okay, thank we you. have another motion to amend the agenda. Well, we're going to amend the agenda. I'm just telling everybody the rest of the information that's on the information we're going to forego until the next meeting. Alrighty, because we have, we have to get on with this. Go. Kathy, go. A motion to amend the agenda um, to item public session to reference the hearing of one grievance pertaining to insurance premium overpayments. So, so moved. Uh, it was so moved. So moved. Seconded by Kat, uh, Gladys. Mm -hmm. There is no discussion. I'm hearing no discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So we're in executive session. I'm sorry, people. No, no, no. no, no, no. Now we have to go. Now we're going to executive session. Do you have any board reports? Or there's no board reports? 